Anthony, you caught me off guard there. I was just enthralled in singing and we didn't stand and I thought, is this the song before the lesson? Uh, anyway, it was good to keep singing there anyway. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit this afternoon about vain labor. Uh, there are things in life that I think we all desire and want. Uh, we want a good family. We want a good family life. We want to live happily and, and peaceably. Uh, we want protection from, from the world, from the violence and the crimes that are, that are going uh, on about us in the world today. We want to feel secure and be uh, secure. Uh, we want success in any endeavor that we choose to uh, partake in, whether it's work or, or a hobby or whatever. We want to be successful. Uh, we as a nation, we as people, we want victory whenever we are inclined to have a, a war. We don't uh, enter into a war and say, well, I want to go into this, but I want to lose. You know, we, we really want a lot of things out of life. Uh, many of us really want to uh, be involved in worship that pleases God. You know, not everyone, but many of us want that. Uh, we want our congregation and uh, sister congregations to flourish and to grow. You know, all of these things uh, take time and energy and take work. They just don't happen by themselves. They, they take a lot of thought and a lot of work and a lot of preparation. Yet, our efforts alone what we put out into them ourselves will not ensure that these things happen. We need more than what we can do. And what I'm alluding to is, uh, if I get it to click, Psalms 127, verse 1 and 2, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman walk waketh but in vain it is vain for you to rise up early to sit up late to eat the bread of sorrows for so he giveth his beloved sheep if we leave god out of any of our endeavors and plans in life uh, if it's successful it's just by blind luck you know if we want to ensure that all that we do and all that we're involved in are successful we need to include and not only include God but make him the biggest part of our endeavors um, I think if you you look at this scripture reading in these two verses vain is used three times uh, you know if we look at some of Solomon's writings uh, the theme is that human enterprises only succeed by divine blessing we need to ask God to bless our efforts in, in everything that we do, not in our personal lives and, and things that we do, not just as we're sitting in church to worship, but in all our whole lives, in everything that we do, because what we do makes us who we are. What we practice makes us who we are. If we only practice uh, being godly on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights and, and Wednesday evenings, then the rest of our life is, is sort of trivial compared to that we need to ask God to bless our lives and all that we do and and not just ask him to, to pray for that and to work with that in mind not all labor succeeds you know there are labors that fail all that we set out to do sometimes doesn't please us Sometimes we are displeased with things in our life and things that happen. So all labor is not uh, successful. Some labor fails. Uh, when we look at our families, we desire certainly uh, good homes and we desire uh, God's blessings to be part of our families. And uh, there's nothing wrong with desiring those things. I think that God would have us to uh, be happy and, and joy-filled and have a wonderful family. 
but you know, good homes and good families don't happen by accident. They take a lot of work. It's like a marriage. It doesn't happen by accident. It takes a lot of work with both parties. Uh, and it also takes God's blessings. In Psalms 127 and verse 1, it, the word house here, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. The scripture implies that it may refer to a temple, but I think it implies more than that, except the Lord build the house. I think it's, it's far-reaching. Uh, I think it implies that any home that we build as a Christian, any endeavor that we seek as a Christian in our life, except the Lord build the house, except the Lord is a part of it, we may be doing it in vain. If we leave God out of whatever we do, what we do may be just, just vain labor uh, if, if God is not a part of it. Uh, 127 verses 3 and 5 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I think the Lord blesses us uh, when we have families and have fa happy families. It doesn't imply that a small family is, is not going to receive the blessings of God. Uh, certainly he blesses many children with, with families, but uh, there may be times when it's God's will that someone not have a family. You know, Paul said over in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 7, I would that all men were even as myself. And he was speaking about him not having a wife and not having a family, that he could devote his time to God and not have any, uh, anything that drew him away from it. It said, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. Uh, Yet without God's involvement in all that we do, many times our efforts are going to fail. They're going to fall short in whatever we choose to do. So it's important that we put forth the effort and live a life and, and, and involve God in it in the way that God would have us to live. Matthew 10, 37 says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And so does that mean that we're to just disown our family and forget about them? No. But it does mean that we should worship God in a true uh, manner and a true way and be a faithful Christian regardless of what our family thinks or what our family says. Uh, Matthew 10 37 says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Uh, that's a, a love that's far greater than anything else. And that's putting God first. If we put family before God and, and say, well, you don't want me to, to be in the uh, religious position I'm, at, I'm in. Maybe I wasn't brought up in that. Uh, so I'll not do it just to please you. You're not doing anybody any favors. You're certainly not doing your family any favors and you're not doing yourself any favors. You worship God the way that God intends for uh, us to worship Him and uh, our families will have to uh, exist with us worshiping in truth the way that we should to God. You know, protection from violence and evil is an, is an area that we really think about sometimes because we look at the newspaper, we, we see the uh, headlines in the news, and we see all that's going on in the, in the world. I'm reminded that it's not anything new that even in days of old, cities had walls built around them for protection to isolate themselves from the evil that was around them. They also had watchmen that would stand guard at night while the city was asleep. Uh, so it's been a concern of mankind from, from early on that uh, about violence and about protection. Uh, 1 Timothy 5 and 8 
It says, but if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith, faith and is worse than an infidel. We want to provide a safe home, a safe environment, away from the world, away from all of these evil things for our, our families. But if we don't include God in it, are we really protecting them from the evil in the world? No, uh, we're not. If God is a part of our lives and a part of our children's lives and teaching them, then we're protecting them from the evil in the world. And our labor is not in vain. You know, there's a, we must have God in all that we do or, or all we're working for is really in vain. Uh, keep in mind that the only way we can have true security is with God. And I'm not talking about an armed guard or I'm not talking about uh, bulletproof windows, but I'm talking about security of mind, peace of mind and happiness. The only way that we can truly have that and, and have that for our families and, and that type of protection is with God. No one else can offer us that. Uh, we can provide locked doors, we can provide security systems, but if we're not having God be a part of our families, our security is gone. We don't have that security. Uh, we're just passing day by day. Uh, Psalms 121 and 2 says, My help cometh from the Lord. And indeed, those words are very true. I, you know, we always talk about this congregation being such a praying and caring and loving congregation. And I'm just tickled to be a part of it because it is. It's a very praying and heartfelt congregation when it comes to the needs of 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 our members here uh, but you know I think it's that way because we are so strong in faith and, and keep God involved and do everything and worship in a, in a true and right right way uh, if we didn't do those things I don't think that this congregation would be what it is today if we just worshiped any old way and we didn't involve and keep God in a position that's number one in a way that we have done in the past, I, I don't know that our anything that we do as a congregation would be as good as what it is today. Um, you know, we're away from our congregation much more than we are with them. So what we do in our lives make a, makes a big difference. Ephesians 4.28 says, Let him labor with his hands the thing which is good. Well, the thing which is good is those things which please God. Uh, even in our work, even in our labors, we're to keep in mind and to do things and keep God a part of it. Uh, despite all of our efforts to work, <clears throat> make long hard hours and make a, a good living if we fail to include God in it our labor is really in vain we're only going to enjoy that for a short time and after that we're not going to be able to enjoy anything if God's not a part of it because our security and our hope of heaven is not going to be there uh, Ecclesiastes 2 and 26 says for God giveth to man that is good uh, God will bless us when we keep him first in our life in all that we do. Uh, Matthew 6 and 33, we read this all the time and we talk about it and it's so true. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Everything in our life will become easier and be better when we include God and put God first in our lives. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Not second, not third, not at the end of our list, but first. Seek ye, God, seek ye first the kingdom of God. If we do that, all that we do will be more likely to be successful and not be in vain because we're putting God first. You know, if we want to succeed in anything, we need to put God first in it. You know, I said earlier, War sometimes is inevitable with, with nations, but we never as a nation entered a war with the intentions of, of being a loser. You know, we, we may have not won every war that we've ever been in, and there's certainly been internal wars that tore this nation apart, but you know, the idea is when you go to war with another nation, you want to be successful, you want to win. 
Uh, sometimes we get the feeling that since we're a great nation, we can go to war with anybody and we're going to win. That's not necessarily the truth. You know, we don't have to be a great nation to be able to be a winner. You know, smaller nations can be winners. Uh, I have to go back and think about victory. It doesn't always come with the greatest uh, nation or the greatest person. Uh, look at David and Goliath. If that were the case, David would not have had a chance against this giant of a warrior. And yet he succeeded. Why? Well, it's pretty evident he had God on his side. He put God first. If David was not the godly man that he was even at that age and didn't have God in his life, I don't believe that there would be any chance of him being successful against this giant warrior. But he did put God first. Uh, you know, preparation alone and, and motivation to do something will not guarantee your success. And you can put a lot of effort into something. I see businesses all the time that <clears throat> a lot of study has gone into location to place a business, a lot of money, a lot of effort, and business fails. The door shut after a period of time. Just because you put a lot of effort into something doesn't guarantee it to be successful. But I promise you, if you put God first in the mix uh, of all that you do, your chances of success are going to be much greater than if you leave God out. <clears throat> Uh, Psalms 33, 16 says, A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. So that doesn't mean, that means that just because we're a great nation doesn't mean we're going to win our battles all the time. What really helps us in our battles, whether they're wars or skirmishes or, or battles within this nation, is that we put God first in everything. Uh, sadly, this nation has gotten away from uh, what it was founded on and the godly principles, but it's scary at times to think about what we've come to as a nation from where we started. You know, from godly men that prayed every day when they were writing the Constitution and uh, Declaration of Independence and prayed daily when they were making the bylaws and, and, and laws about this nation. And now we can't even pray in a, in a government place or a government assembly. It's gotten to a, a sad situation. But I think when you take God out of the equation, that's what happens. You know, we've let, and I'm not saying we've done it, but we've let other people take God out of this nation by sitting still and not doing nothing. We should have been out in the streets uh, with signs saying, you know, uh, keep prayer in school, do this, do that. But, you know, why, waging a war against uh, taking God out of everything completely. But we did not do that. And, and maybe at some point in time, this nation will put God back uh, where he needs to be in this nation. Uh, it's our duty as Christians that we keep God first, that we proclaim uh, his goodness, his, his praises. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9 says that ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, uh, that you should show forth the praises of him that have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, and I don't think today that we're the nation uh, as a whole that has set their self apart. Surely there are a lot of Christians in this nation and I'm thankful every day that we have the freedoms that we have to be able to assemble and worship. But as a whole, I think this nation has a lot to learn and maybe in time it will happen. And sometimes I shudder to think what our grandchildren and their children may have to endure in time uh, if they experience as much change as we have in the last hundred years. Uh, not that we've seen it all, I'm not that old, but uh, we will see a lot of change. Our children and children and, and their children will see much change if the Lord doesn't return. And, and I just have to wonder what they'll have to endure in a nation that has continually put God uh, out of things and kept God out of things. We get down and talk about all of our things in life, about our country, but when we come right down to us as individuals, 
and our relationship with God, it's all about uh, our worship to God. It's all about where we hold God and what place we give God in our lives. Uh, we have to understand that not all worship is acceptable to God. And people have a mistaken identity that, or, or belief that, <clears throat> hey, I can offer God any kind of worship. I can do it my way. After all, I'm giving to God when I'm worshiping. But God will not accept worship in, under any circumstances other than what He has de declared to be the, the right way. Uh, and we can worship in, in many different ways and it not be acceptable to God. And what is acceptable God, to God is only when we do it in a way in accordance with what He has given us and what He has taught us. Uh, Proverbs 15 and verse 8 <clears throat> says, <clears throat> excuse me, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is His delight. The sacrifice of the wicked. If the people exclude God and want to worship in a way that they want and not in a way that God wants, they're not uh, upright anymore. They're considered wicked. Remember, we're either with God or we're, we're without God. So if we offer worship in a way that we want, in a way that pleases us, rather than in a way that pleases God, we're not upright in our worship anymore we're uh, wicked and it says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord what's an abomination it's something that God despises so greatly uh, so it falls in the same category you know he says man shall not lie with man woman shall not lie with woman it is an abomination to God here it says the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to God you know we think and sometimes think, well, there's little sins, there's big sins, there's little things that you can do, and there's big things you shouldn't do, but, you know, the sacrifice of the wicked. If you're not uh, offering your worship to God in a true and correct way, uh, God's not going to accept it. Uh, worship that is based upon man's teachings rather than God's teachings is in vain and God will never accept that Matthew 15 and 9 says but in vain they do worship me teachings the doctrines of the commandments of men uh, it's sad today that so many people have so many different variations how to worship God uh, there's a whole variety of way people worship God how can everyone be right? How can everyone be true in their worship and doing it so different? Well, we can't. Uh, and I'm saying as, as human beings, we can't all be right. Now, the truth is we could all be wrong, but we can't be right. But we can't all be right. And how do we know that we're trying to do it in the right and correct way? Well, we do it in the way that God has instructed us to do it. Uh, and not have our labor fail. If we do it any way we want, our labor is in vain. It's definitely going to, to fail. What about our labors within a congregation? Uh, a work that we're doing or a work that we're involved in. Uh, well, we want to make sure we're doing it and we want to make sure we pray for God's blessings and God to lead us and guide us in the work that we do and the things that we do. If we don't do those things, then, you know, what we do is in vain. If we just want to do it to, to look good as a church in the community or a congregation in the community and we don't care the end result, uh, we're not, we're pretty vain about what we're doing. Uh, we need to uh, always remember that God has to be... If, in front and foremost in all that we do. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abound in, or bounding in the work of the Lord. You know, it, it's His work. We're just servants of His. We're just doing the work. It's His commands. It's His way to do things, not ours. So we need to remember we have to do it His way and not uh, our way. Hebrews 6 and 10 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. On the other hand, when we do do it in a way that God approves of, 
He's not going to forget how we've worshipped Him, how we love Him, how we work for His kingdom and the things that we do. He's going to bless us in our everyday life. He's going to make our life more joy-filled, uh, going to make it successful uh, because we're doing His will and involving Him and putting Him first in our lives. And we all want to be successful in, in things that we do. And, and what I'm telling you is that to be more successful in everything we do, put God first in your life. Without God, you don't have a chance. It's going to be dumb luck if you succeed. If you put God first in your life, the chances of your success are going to be far greater than ever without God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything of ourselves, uh, but our sufficiency is of God. There's things that we can't do and can never do, but there's not anything that God can't do. Uh, why would you not want to put Him first in your life and involve Him in everything that you do, knowing that there's not a thing that God can't do? Uh, if you're living your life and, and putting God first and in, in a godly way and praying to God, there's not a thing that God cannot do if it's within His will and He wants to do that. But without Him, there's not a lot that you can accomplish. You can accomplish small feats, but again, they're not going to accompany you when this life is over. You know, the thing that you want and want to strive for and work for is you want what's going to accompany you when this life is over because it's short. Uh, as we live and, and have families and grow and mature, we want God to continue to bless us day by day, and He'll do that if we put Him first. Uh, will we look at God to bless our work and our labors of love? We should, uh, because He'll bless us when we do that. Will we look to God as our shield and protector? We should, because then He'll protect us. And But no matter what happens here, we've got that protected home in heaven forever. Uh, will we look to God to guide us in our worship to Him? Well, we absolutely should do that, because if we do it any other way, it's in vain and He'll never accept it. Uh, I always like to think about the words of Solomon. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Uh, and it doesn't matter if it's uh, the home that you live in, uh, the place you work in, the business you have, the, the place you worship in, unless God builds that, uh, it's in vain. All that we do must incorporate God in our lives. Uh, it stands to reason that He would only approve of of a, a home that he's involved in to be a place to worship. So why wouldn't he approve of everything we do uh, and having him first? Well, he would. He, he, that's the way he wants us to live. He wants us to be separated from the rest of the world, to be set aside. And he wants our lives to be that way. Uh, to ensure our labor not to be in vain, uh, I like what Moses says over in uh, Psalms 90 and 17. He says, Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands. You know, that, that should be our prayer every day, that let God be upon us, let Him guide our hands, let Him guide us in all that, that we endeavor to do. Uh, where we worship, how we worship, how we live, how we work, how we raise our family. Uh, we need to look to God to uh, establish uh, everything that we do so that our labors won't be in vain. I hope if you're here tonight that you are a Christian. But if you're not a Christian, I, I really want you to understand that your entire life needs to be centered around God. Uh, to be a success and to be approved of by God, it needs to be centered around God. I had the privilege... Friday and Saturday to go spend some time with my brother and some friends of his uh, that he goes to church with and uh, I had met this fellow before his name was Steve Reeder and he was 78 years old and he's a Jewish fellow and he comes and hangs out with my brother and his friends and uh, goes to church with them occasionally although he's a Jew he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. He thinks Jesus was just a prophet. 
and they're still waiting on the Messiah. And I got an opportunity to, to talk with Steve several times. And uh, we actually, uh, he wanted to go and ride the Okoye whitewater rafting with us. And he was 78, and we put him in our raft and took care of him. But on the bus ride back, he was talking to me, and he said, you know, he said, I'm just almost at the point where I can believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He said, but I've just been raised, and my family has been raised so long that he's just a prophet. He said, I'm just not ready to make that decision. And I talked to him quite a bit about uh, the crucifixion, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and, and how important it is and to accept that and to be baptized for the remission of sins. And he says, you know, I'm just, I'm almost there. He said, I'm just not quite ready. And I have to think about Agrippa when he told Paul, you, you, you almost persuadeth me to be a Christian. If you're here tonight, don't be almost persuaded. You know, be persuaded to be a Christian because any life that is without God is in vain. It's not going to prosper. And it's certainly not going to be a life that God approves of. If you're here tonight, do what God wants you to do to become His child. Hear the Word of God. Believe it. Be repentful. Confess Christ as the Son of God. And be baptized for the remission of sins. If we can help you tonight and you're not a Christian, don't put it off any longer. Come down and obey the gospel. If you are a Christian and maybe you've fallen away, then there's no better time than tonight to rededicate your life back to God. If we can help you, let's stand and sing this song of encouragement. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for me. See on the portals He's waiting and watching, watching for Yeah.